Okay, we're behind schedule, but welcome right. to welcome to <laughs> bad introduction. that introduction. That is going to happen. Um, so we're back with development. So uh, okay, now you have a concept for a game. Now you know what you have an idea of what you want to do. You have some baseline kind of guiding principles. You've got some themes. You have some um, hopefully just ideas for mechanics. You can start to knit these things together. So now is that process, right? So development is um, tends to be the longest kind of stage of LARP, like making a LARP, uh, especially if you're working with a large team and you're doing a larger scale event. Um, the development can take a lot of time in those cases. So we're going to kind of talk about what are the elements of um, basically this is this is going to be about game design uh, largely and um, how to a game design. How, how, how do? <laughs> All right. Starting <laughs> with game structures. So one of the beautiful things about game design is that there is no right way to do it, um, but there are many different frameworks for how to think about game design. And I'm going to present to you uh, one of the frameworks for thinking about game design, which uh, basically just poses some useful questions and kind of draws forth different elements and then you think about those elements as you're developing and producing your game. So these, this is like what should tend to be a pretty comprehensive list of different elements that will help you kind of uh, uh, really nail down all the different aspects of what you're doing. Okay, so in game design, we think of um, uh, game structures in two categories. There are formal elements and there are dramatic elements. So the formal elements of a game include the following things. Players, how many? Do they have need special knowledge? Are there any requirements for the for your players? So thinking about players, um, I put players first for a reason, and that's because players are essential to a LARP. And you, I think it's really important as a designer to be thinking not just about your awesome, super amazing idea, but really like thinking about the player experience. What is the journey of playing your game going to feel like for the player? And if you're putting your player first, you're going to be a lot more successful at designing games. Like, you know, players are the core of what we're doing. We're trying to build these interactive worlds, and so putting players first is very intentional. Uh, objective. What is the objective of the game? Um, this can be as simple as have fun, or it can be as complex as, um, you know, teach people about gentrification. And, like, the objective of the game is, is something you, you want to kind of nail down. Um, procedures. What are the required actions for play, right? So uh, procedures could be something like um, uh, people need to you know, walk into this very specific space and then they need to go this way and then they can uh, interact with this puzzle in this way. Just thinking about the different kind of procedures like actions, actions that people can take uh, surrounding play. Those are procedures. Rules, what are the limits on player actions, right? Rules help us define boundaries. <coughs> um, are there rules regarding behavior? Like, those things are, are important for you to establish. Um, conflict. What causes conflict in this game? Uh, boundaries. What are the boundaries of the game? Um, are they physical? Are they conceptual? Boundaries are, are a, a really interesting thing to explore because the boundaries of your game, as you start to think about boundaries, that may actually open you up to new ideas about ways in which your game can manifest. And so saying, like, the boundaries of this game are that the game is played between, like, 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. on Sundays um, for forever. Like, that could be a, a, an interesting boundary to play with, right? Um, so physical boundaries, conceptual boundaries, how does this all work? Like, you know, where, where does game take place? Formal elements of game design. And then there are dramatic elements in game design. Um, this is not all of them, but this is some. So dramatic elements include challenge. What creates challenge in the game? And how will you find that kind of flow state between challenge and ability? So when you think of game design, we're almost thinking on this axis of like, here's challenge, right? And here's ability. And you want to kind of like hit this nice middle arc where you're like, that flow state is in between where uh, you don't want the person to be too challenged initially because their ability is going to increase the more practice they have at it. And the challenge should increase in, in accordance with their ability. So finding a good flow state in between challenge and ability is, is really important. Uh, play. Um, 
Clay is is just one of the most uh, uh, like fundamental concepts of game design, and defining what is play is uh, something that people have been arguing about for forever. Um, there's a lot of what play is not. Play is not work, right? Um, but what is play is a, is a big concept. But um, you know play when you are doing it. Play like has this element of fun. It has this element of uh, you know feeling like you have agency and and uh, autonomy in this world. So is uh, is there a, plen a, a sense of play within the rules of your game? Like can people play with the rules? Like is that something you want to include? Um, and is the play chance based? Uh, these are like like basically four different categories of play states. Uh, chance based play, um, which I think you can all probably think of a chance based like play thing. Like gambling is is can be chance based play. Um, competitive, right? So like head to head, like is that the the, the, the play? Make believe, um, which is a lot of what we're doing. Uh, or vertigo. Um, vertigo is this really interesting play state of like think of it like tightrope walking or um, you know, being in a, a, a dangerous like, physical scenario can also feel really like play and fun to a lot of people. Um, so these are basically the four kinds of different states of play. And a lot of the times that you feel play, you'll be able to kind of categorize like, oh, okay, that actually fits within that. This is like play because it's make-believe. This is play because it's like chance-based. Uh, you know, this is play because it's vertigo. So um, I just thought it was really interesting to kind of like everyone knows formal elements. Um, so premise, uh, how will you establish the action of the game within a setting or a metaphor, right? So the premise of your game, like this gets back to some of the earlier conceptual work that we were doing, right? Like a lot of these things are kind of repeating those same things that we were thinking about in conceptualization. But now you have these like formalized structures for thinking about it. So those are some of the dramatic elements. And then one that I think is extraordinarily important <clears throat> that I wanted to draw forward is character because so much of what we do in LARP surrounds the idea of character and embodying character. Um, and I wanted to kind of raise this idea of the difference between character and avatar, right? So in game design, we think of a character is a kind of a pre-designed, they, pre they have a backstory, predetermined backstory, they have like predetermined motivations, and you may give someone that character and then they embody that character. From there, they may kind of add in their own avatar elements to it, but an avatar is something that someone else creates, like they, it's player created, allows for uh, customization, dynamic agency within that, that, pair, that, um, that avatar. Um, so your LARP can have either and both. You can knit these concepts together, right? Um, but I like to kind of like, draw them apart so that you can see the differences between character versus avatar. Um, so many, many LARPs utilize NPC characters who are going to help direct the action and build meaningful connections between themselves and other players. Um, I have a lot of like beliefs and feelings about NPCs and like how to uh, create effective NPCs for your games, which I will talk about now. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I believe that NPCs are uh, often, you'll see, uh, uh, manifestations of the game designers like desires for what they want the game to be in the NPC. Um, I think that that can be a very slippery slope to go down. Uh, if, somebody, if, if people are, are drawn to that character and there's stories to be built there, awesome. Now you have the NPC is doing what they're supposed to do, right? They're directing the action, they're building meaningful connections between the, uh, their, like that character and the other player or between other, character, uh, other players in order to create like, drama, tension, conflict, um, you know, other interesting things that can happen over the course of that. Um, but it can be not great when the NPC characters are the only way to get any sort of thing done and that uh, it can sometimes feel like the GM's avatar as opposed to a character. And I warn you away from creating uh, uh, NPC characters who are avatars. Um, of course, like those things will naturally manifest because you're playing the character, and like, welcome to psychology. You're just going to build in some of your own stuff into it because you know that's just we're human and that's what we do. 
But I would say, as a rule of thumb, try to steer away from building characters who are just there to um, for your own for your own like enjoyment. Um, if a character has meaningful connections with other PCs, great. If so, if those PCs are no longer at your game and you're still playing that character, like why? Why? Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Make sure that your NPC has purpose, like that they're driving the action, that they're building relationships, that they have you know reasons to be there, um, so that you're not just kind of like playing your own game. That can be fun and can be wonderful, and also it's okay to like take some time for yourself and do some self care and be like. I'm just going to go out and play this character who's fun for me to play, and I'm going to sit around the fire because it's like two in the morning, and we're just going to have, you know, fake and game booze and, and do that. That is also okay, but um, it can, uh, if you're playing that character during like the driving action moments of game, then uh, it can just really detract from the experience. So they try to build NPCs who are there to, to support those, those story motivations that you want to bring forward. Okay, rules. Everyone's favorite part, right? Okay, so when we think about rules, we need to think about systems, right? Uh, everything is a system, like everything. Uh, the parking meters outside are part of a system, right? The uh, public transportation system, like, you know, the T is a system, so you can call it a system. Like, pretty much everything in society is, is part of a system. Like, and if you start to think of systems at, like, on that level, it's going to become <coughs> easier and easier for you to start to kind of, like, pull apart, like, okay, what are rules and what are mechanics and, like, how, how do these things, like, you know, uh, how, how are they different? I would say that rules describe mechanics. You know, your rules are the, the ways in which you are uh, uh, communicating to your players what the mechanics are that build the system in which everyone is residing. So uh, rules describe mechanics by which players are able to interact with the systems that govern and influence your world. So uh, bear in mind the system that you design will tell your players who and how they can be in your world. So if you don't want them to be jerks, don't design systems that allow for jerks to like, just take those parts out. Um, and then design systems that reinforce the types of behavior that you want to see. So for example, you want players to be welcoming to newbies. So you create a system by which uh, players, if they adopt a new player into their guild, then they all are able to advance more quickly in knowledge, right? So now we have this kind of constructivist, like pedagogical kind of thing that we're, that everyone is. So now a newbie comes in and suddenly all the kids are like, join my guild, join my guild, join my guild, like please, please be welcome here. You know, now, now you have people like, excitedly competing over being welcoming and model, <coughs> as opposed to being like, oh, new player, they only have like two coins. I don't care. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm on the road. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So you can, you can design systems that are reinforcing behavior types that you want. So, do, do, do. now I'm gonna talk about Bartle's player taxon. Is anyone very familiar with Richard Bartle? Yeah, Richard Bartle is a uh, game designer back from the, the ancient days of MUDs. Um, he developed some of the first uh, MUDs, which are multi-user dungeons, uh, back in the 70s, I think 1978, is when Richard Bartle made the first multi-user dungeon. Um, and he developed a taxonomy, um, which I think is just useful. I don't think that this is like a, a hard and fast, like this is perfect and, and wonderful in every way, but nothing in game, you know, game philosophy really is. Like you know, the way that we describe systems is like we're still constantly evolving and like learning new things. But I do think that this is like pretty applicable to ours. So along this axis, you have like some different elements within your, 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 your game, right? You have the world that you have developed and the world that exists, yeah? And then you have players. You have the people who are, are you know, interacting within that world. And then you have these, this is kind of like the axis of desire, like player desire, right? So some players really enjoy acting with, and some players really enjoy 
acting upon, acting on. <clears throat> so uh, where, where this ends up is uh, this really kind of interesting framework, right? So within this sphere, so this is acting with other players, you have the socializers, right? So uh, you have people who are, they're there to, they're there for the player interactions, they're there to collaborate with other people, they really are excited to like socialize and build relationships and stuff like that. Then down here you have the uh, people who like to act with your world, right? They want to like, uh, you know, co-create the world with you. They want to like explore new regions. They want to like uncover interesting knowledge. They want to do that. Those are the explorers. Um, then over here you have your uh, people who enjoy player interactions, but they enjoy acting upon uh, other players. And we call those the killers. <laughs> Uh, so they tend to be really interested in PvP, and um, you can encourage this or discourage this by the different systems that you design. Yeah. Uh, and you can encourage non-killing behavior. Absolutely. To the to other exactly. Exactly. You can you can create systems by which people can act on other players, but not ruin their good time by like killing their character forever. You know, you can create systems like. Oh, you're gonna like act on this other player and destroy their reputation, and like, oh, my reputation's destroyed, which creates interesting conflict for them, and then they're like, no, I have to build my reputation again. Ah, I'm losing <laughs> life. You know, and so you can create systems where people can have all these different dynamics that they enjoy, um, or you can like make sure that those systems don't exist. Like, if you don't want one of these player groups at your game, then you can be you can be judicious about how you design, decide to design those systems, and then you have acting on the world, and here you have the achievers, right? This is the people who want to win. They want to win the LARP. They're going to like totally kill every bad guy and like win everything and do the things. And, um, and like the, uh, people tend to be like makeups of all these different player types to some degree, but most people tend to have one category or another that they prefer, like that, that just feels better to them and that kind of like aligns with their desires a little more. So I think that, uh, so I bring this forward because I you know, want you to think about when you're thinking about rules and systems, understanding the diversity of different player types and like, you know, are you going to create uh, uh, worlds and plots and the things that allow people to, to interact in all of these different frameworks? Or do you want to say like, actually this game is not for killers. Like I don't want killers at my game. I'm gonna very specifically make a game that, is, that doesn't allow for that. Or I'm going to make a game that is only for killers, and this is going to be like a heavily competitive, paranoia, like you know, backstabbing, murder, like all those things are completely okay. It's whatever you want to design. Um, so you know, thinking about like player types and that taxonomy, I just wanted to bring that forward. Okay. Okay. Existing systems. There's a lot of systems out there. Um, very popular American buffer uh, systems, um, especially in the Massachusetts scene right now, the accelerant system is extraordinarily uh, well known. Um, it's uh, my experience with accelerant is that it is really excellent system for a sporty LARP combat game. If you want to have uh, long protracted wave battles, that have like an ebb and a flow and like you know times where people are, are like down and they're gonna they're totally gonna lose and then like they come back and like ah they, and like yeah. if that if that's what you're going for and, and it's like a fairly athletic kind of um, kind of game that you're that you want to do, Accelerant is really, really great for that. Um, uh, Nero is like has been around for forever. Um, I actually don't have a lot of hands-on experience with Nero systems, just in like things that took the Nero system and then uh, uh, iterated on that and iterated on that and iterated on that. Um, Accelerant kind of is one of those systems. Accelerant, I think, was as a baseline had Nero as its inspiration and then went from there and like and you know blew out the system and, and changed the parts they didn't like. Um, but the Nero system still exists. You can look at that for inspiration. Um, both of those systems kind of came out of the tradition of like D&D, &D, you know, the classic like D&D &D RPG. 
Um, but there are a bunch of other systems that come from like the indie RPG scene, and I would say that like looking at indie RPG systems as inspiration for like different mechanics and things that you can incorporate is a great, great way to go. Um, uh, B Epic has like a system that kind of is like a variant of Accelerant, which is a variant of Nero, which is a variant of you know like a lot of these things ha tend to have like similar structures and similar kinds of mechan uh, mechanisms. Um, the Myth Arc system. Um, this is a system that I have designed for, but this is my shameless self-promotion self part of it. So the MythArc system, uh, totally free and available to, uh, to look up. It's published in GameRap, um, and the system is designed for um, uh, buffer combat, uh, but with a much heavier emphasis on narrative design, and so there's a lot of mechanisms and systems that are there to support narrative development, um, story arc development, personal character growth. Um, so uh, take a look at MythArc if you're interested in that. Um, and then uh, there's a, a, a universal LARP system called Kronos that uses cards for conflict resolution. Um, that one's pretty interesting. I think there's a lot of, like, it, it actually works fairly well. Um, some people really don't like having cards as a, a resolution mechanic because they're like, it breaks my emotion. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, but uh, you know it, it exists. Like, take a look at it. It's, uh, it's you can take whatever from it you would like. Um, there are tons and tons of different theater style systems that exist. Um, Cthulhu Live, like I actually really enjoy the Cthulhu Live system, but the combat resolution is grueling, very very painful. But uh, if that's what you're going for, if you're trying to punish players for getting into combat, then that's a great system to, to do. <laughs> Yeah. There's a lot of ways to expose yourself to many of these systems. Yeah. There are two con, two free cons, one of which I've already heard people talk about today, which is Intercon. Intercon. But Dexcon and Dream Nation, they both run so many games that use so many of these systems. So if you're like, I don't know how I feel about Chronos, I have benefit of just getting to jump into a four hour Chronos game and experience that mechanic. Absolutely. Um, and there's always people from New England who travel down. So they, uh, Dream Nation and Dexcon are in. Jersey, Jersey, right? Jersey, but it's like the easiest trip to Jersey ever. Yeah, yeah. It's, so, it's only like four hours ish, right? It's like not that far. So from Maine it's seven, yeah. but it took me two hours to get here today. So it's, re it's like reasonable. <laughs> it's reasonable. Because <laughs> Maine is the end of the world. It's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, Dreamation Dream and Dexcon. Um, they take they do both take place at the same hotel. The Hyatt Regency in Morristown. Yep. And one's uh, in uh, like midwinter and one's in midsummer, right? Yes. Yes. Um, and, uh, Metatopia happens in the fall, which is, right. if you have a game and you, this is my favorite con, if you have a game and you're like, I want to play test it, who can I get to play test this event? You go to Metatopia and you bring your game, mm -hmm. and they provide you people to play test your game from all over the country or the world. And it's, it's like, I play test 13 games in a weekend and I come, I come home jazzed to see what people are doing. So those are other ways that you can play with systems. Absolutely. Okay. All right. That's okay. great. Okay. No. Be quiet. Excellent note. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, theater style systems, Cthulhu Live, there's NES, the, you know, NES, like, had the storyteller system, now it's evolved into something slightly different, and then there are, like, very, 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 of all those systems. Um, so many more. There are so many different systems out there. I personally have, like, an insane library of different, like, live action, like, you know, indie live action games and systems and designs. I am super happy to share those things. Uh, in my lending library, I'd be more, ha more than happy to send it out to people. Um, and yeah, there's so many systems, it's not really worthwhile listing them all. So yeah, familiar yourself with systems. Go to LARPCons, play things that have a, you know, big variance in different systems. And there's a trend even like more and more so that I have seen at, at Intercon, at the very least, to have systemless games. Like games where, or, or the system is like, discover the system in game. Um, or the system is like, you know, you're going to find a piece of paper that has a memory on it, and then you're going to have an experience. Like, you know, like the and like all these things are totally valid and wonderful ways to to incorporate mechanics and systems into your game. Um, and I think that like the the hard part there is just like doing the homework of of system design. Um, so utilize your resources. People like me who have all this system knowledge in my brain, like 20 years worth of like ridiculous system knowledge, that I can be like, oh. That sounds just like this thing. Oh, you should look at this thing. Have you heard of this designer? So um, utilize your resources. If you have a game idea and you're like, but I'm not sure where to take it from here, 
um, ask ask your, your game design resources. We have a, like a great community of people here, and I'm always excited, literally always excited to talk about game design. <laughs> like people are like, oh, it must be like so hard for you to talk about game design all the time. This week you get so bored. I'm like, no, never. <laughs> always want to talk about game design. Let's talk about it. Okay. Okay, world building. World building is a fun topic. <laughs> okay, so world building um, is exactly what it sounds like, right? It is the idea of taking your world and fleshing it out. There are basically two different ways to approach world building that are classically understood. There is the top down world building approach, and there is the bottom up world building approach. Top down, in top down, the designer first creates a general overview of the world, determining broad characteristics such as the world's inhabitants, technology level, geographic features, climate history. From there, the rest of the world is developed in increasing detail. Um, you kind of get the idea here, right? You're starting with this like very broad concept of like, I want this world to feel like this. The downside here is that it can become difficult to figure out what story you want to tell in that world, right? Now you have this amazing world and you have no story at all. And you're like, okay, now I have to make a story. Well, let's see, I have this incredible network of trains and all this like this, that, this and that and the other, but then there's not like, it, it can sometimes be uh, overwhelming for the uh, being able to pick out a single story because now you have this huge world and your story potential is infinite, right? So. Picking a story in that world can be very difficult. Then, there's the bottom-up approach to world building, right? So in the bottom-up approach, the designer focuses on a small part of the world that is needed for their purposes, usually that story. Uh, this location is given considerable details such as geography, culture, social structure, government politics, history, and even like, you know, NBC characters and things like that. And now you have that this tends to be the, the approach that people take when they're like, they know the story that they want to tell in that setting. The downside here is that um, as your world expands, because it will, as you tell, after, as you're done with your first arc and now you're moving on to your second arc, you need to expand outward, 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 outward. And if you don't have those other larger ideas developed, what you can get is a just alphabet soup of of insanity, right? Like where you're like, well, I need to tell this story, so now I'm going to develop a whole new section of the world over here, and now I need to tell this story, so now I'm going to make a whole new section of the world over here, and sometimes those things like won't have matching tones and won't have matching like you know formats or like it's like well, but that society wouldn't exist because this society like had this other thing happen 20 years ago, and now this thing and like and that can be can, can be a challenge also. So what is Great is when you can do both together. Of course, that can be very difficult, but that's why I encourage you to think of um, combining these approaches and then have this, something that is referred to as inferred world building, right? So you create the top down framework loosely, you create the bottom up framework loosely, and then you can allow people to extrapolate allow people to fill in the details for themselves. Um, and this is, I think, especially wonderful if you're creating LARPs where somebody might come to the game and they have a really strong idea for their character concept, but they don't know how to make that story fit within your world. At that point, you can be like, okay, cool, we have this inferred world. Now we can put that like, oh, this that kind of fits here. Why don't we make you part of this culture and this specific thing happen? And now that person is integral to your world and they feel really special and they feel really cool and now that whole thing has become very real both for them and for other players in the game. And the more that you allow that, like the better I think results you get because you get these wonderful knitting together and weaving together this tapestry of different stories that can all take place together. It's important for you to establish that initial framework, so do your top down uh, and do your bottom up, but um, allow for some room, right? Don't make every single religion that has ever existed in the history of your world and be like, no, you have to be exactly this religion and this thing. That's just not even how religion works. You know, people are making new cults all the time. So, <laughs> like, allow for your players to have input on those things and try to yes and their ideas or say yes but. 
And, you know, so I think it's really important for, especially in a format like LARP, which I believe is better as a collaborative format. World building. Oh, this is just my point. Uh, yeah, so inferred world building for collaboration. So yeah, leave sections of your world blank so that people can fill them in. Okay, so these are some of the classic elements of um, immersive worlds, right? So you have the physics of the world. Um, this is especially important when designing like uh, uh, science fiction or fantasy settings. How much of your world is real world physics that you're going to use? Um, how much do you need to really know about it? And how much is magic? And to what degree? How does that stuff work? Um, you know, developing magic systems is super, super fun. And really, like, it's, it's one of the most, like, joyous and enjoyable parts of, of discovery for players, too, is, like, they're like, magic exists, how does it work? <laughs> and, like, building, like, like, building reasonable ways that magic works in your world is really fun to discover. And also, it's fun to allow players to, like, have input on how magic works, because a lot of people have really strong ideas or feelings about how magic works for them and like in their character and like how that manifests. And so again, like with the infer inferred world building, you may want to like have a baseline idea of like how magic works. Like, oh, magic in our world is fueled by, um, you know, uh, how many people believe in something. Or magic in our world is, is uh, uh, you know, uh, powered by these magic rocks or whatever it is, right? Like you may want to have like a baseline system for how that stuff manifests, but you may want to leave it open in terms of all the different kind of manifestations that it can take. Uh, cosmology. So this is the metaphysical and scientific cosmology of the world. So like, are you working with like a huge universe full of planets? What are those planets? Um, or is it like realms and planes? Like, are there gods in your world? Like, how do those gods interact with your world? Like. The metaphysical aspects of like you know how your cosmology takes shape. Um, how did how was the world how was the universe created? Like does anyone know? Do you know? Um, is that open? Like you know just coming up with the the, the cosmology is um, a really enjoyable part of design. Geography, um, map construction, and terrain. Uh, even if your game is taking place in a like in a, at a you know. A, a Boy Scout camp or a Girl Scout camp or a 4-H camp or whatever, and that terrain will never ever change. It is really joyous for players to imagine that there is this huge continent or world that exists outside of that space that they can visit like between games and they can travel around it and that they know the, the physical geographic like landscape of. Um, and so map construction and then understanding the, you know, the terrain of your world um, uh, can be really fun and joyous. And then culture. So what are the constructed cultures like? And here's where I'll add a note of like, be sensitive to the idea of appropriation and you know, be careful about how you're designing those things. Um, think about, am I drawing from like only Western European culture here? Uh, maybe there's a broader brush that I can be painting with. Maybe I can look at other types of cultures. Maybe I can take influence from these different things, but also making sure that you're doing it in a respectful way and that you're not appropriating or, or marginalizing or belittling other cultures. Um, this is a really, really hairy topic and it can be extremely difficult to do. So um, get sensitivity readers. Like lots of people in this room even would be happy to like, you know, help each other out and be like, oh, you know, maybe you don't want to have like these, you know, uh, uh, traveling circus freak people that are just this really specific kind of like, you know, analog for, for like other stereotypes that we might not want to be, be putting forward. Um, yeah, just get people to, get lots of people to take a look at the different cultures in your game so that you're, so that you're, you know that you're being respectful, uh, as respectful as possible while still, you know, building from constructed cultures or con cultures as, uh, as it's often called. Okay, this is a shorter portion because this is a much longer period of, of development, right? So we are going to start working on this stuff. So let's work on game structures, rules, and world building. Obviously these are huge topics. So um, 
Uh, we'll, we'll just take our, we'll take some time with it.